Welcome back everyone. In this lecture we're going to switch gears and focus on the juvenile justice system. Juveniles are very different from adults, from the way they commit their crimes to the crimes that they commit. They also are different in, in developmental stages. They have different cognitive factors at play and at times they're not even able to legally form mens rea. In this lecture we're going to look at things from a historical perspective and make our way through to, mo to the modern juvenile justice system. Let's go ahead and get started. If we look at things historically, we note that juveniles have not always been treated separately from their adult counterparts. It was not until 1899 that the formal juvenile justice system was developed in the United States to deal with the prosecution of juvenile delinquents. When we talk about juvenile delinquency, remember that we're focusing on those juveniles who are between the ages of 7 and 18, the age of adulthood. At age 7, the minors are considered too young to be able to form criminal intent, but also too young to have the cognizance to know what they are doing in most instances. Before the 16th century, minors were viewed as either property or as miniature adults who were expected to assume the responsibilities that adults did. This meant that minors weren't going to school for long periods of time. Instead, they started working earlier and earlier to help support the family. However, not all children even had families. Some lived on the streets or turned to crime as a way to support themselves. Therefore, if minors were going to commit crime, then children would be subjected to the same criminal sanctions as adults. These attitudes changed in the 16th and 17th centuries. Children gradually became viewed as corruptible but worth correcting. Colonists brought these new ideas to America with them where they worked to help reform the way that children were treated. In colonial America, two mechanisms were employed to teach children who were difficult to handle or who needed supervision to learn a trade. The first was the apprenticeship system. It is the method by which middle and upper class children were taught skilled trades by a master. Once the child learned all the skills that they would need to learn, they began to work in the trade and earn a respectable income. Secondly, colonists used the binding out system the practice in which children were bound over to a master for care and education, but under the binding system, masters were not required to teach youth the trade. Religion was another powerful force that shaped social life in the colonies and was the basis for their laws. The redemption of children is inherent in many of the religious practices that were brought over with the colonists. They were working to put children on a better path. By the early 1800s, the industrialization of the United States changed the family-based system of production and of society and created problems on a scale that was previously unheard of. So everything that the colonists were trying hard to reform were in danger of being eliminated by the Industrial Revolution. Children were now working in factories and did not need the same skills they were learning under the apprenticeship system. In the beginning of the 19th century, American cities were seeing tremendous growth, particularly because of immigration. Immigration, in turn, changed the composition of communities and brought on new institutions for dealing with juvenile delinquency. Houses of refuge were designed to be institutions where children could be reformed and turned into hardworking members of the community. A child could be committed to a house of refuge by a constable, by a parent, or on the un or on the order of a city alderman. Houses of Refuge were the first specialized correctional institutions for dealing with youth in the United States. Children would be sent to a house of refuge and would stay there until they aged out of the system. It was by no means a glamorous place to live. Children would have the bare essentials and would learn to work hard for the rest. Children in Houses of Refuge engaged in daily regimens of hard work, military drills, and enforced silence, as well as religious and academic training. Everyone worked in a house of refuge. It was essential to the Reformation to become disciplined, hardworking, and able to follow the directions of those who ran these institutions. After Reformation, boys were frequently indentured to masters on farms or to tradesmen, and girls were placed in domestic service. When houses of refuge were not successful, reformers introduced the practice of placing out. Placing out was the practice of placing children on farms in the Midwest and in the West to remove them from the supposedly corrupting influences of their parents and of the larger cities. 
This was done often without the parents' permission or without their knowledge. Once it was evident that the houses of refuge were no longer working, reformers started to turn to a different type of solution. Institutional reformeries moved juveniles out of the city and into more rural areas. The institution were often very isolated from neighbors or from any oversight. The lack of supervision allowed the institutions to become more overcrowded and sometimes even unsafe. Medical conditions were poor and discipline was often very high. These were not very nice places to be and the juveniles who lived in these homes were often in danger of serious injury even though they were receiving educational training from those who ran the reformatories. There was actually a story on the news not too long ago regarding a reformatory school in Mariana, Florida. There was a lot of debate about the conditions of the school. The boys who survived repeatedly highly abusive conditions, some things that the guards denied. But nevertheless, there were quite a few bodies that were buried on the reformatory school property. When the boys mysteriously died, the school always blamed it on illness and bad nutrition. When the families asked to receive the bodies of their young male relatives, the school always denied the request and instead buried the bodies on the schoolyard grounds. This seems quite suspicious if you ask me. I have actually left a link to the story in the notes section on your PowerPoint. Go read the article and make inferences for yourselves. So this finally brings us to the formation of the formalized juvenile court system. It would be idealistic and naive to believe that we could all handle juvenile issues informally and leave the court system out of it completely. But there were still juveniles who needed some sort of institutional supervision. We owe the new structure of the juvenile justice system to the child savers. The child saving movement was part of the progressive era, which took place from 1880 to 1920, during which the pace of industrialization, urbanization, and immigration all quickened. Reformers worked to improve jail and reformatory conditions. Part of that reform was to keep juveniles out of the same facilities that adults were incarcerated in. Chicago was the first experiment. In 1899 in Cook County, Illinois, they created the first formalized juvenile court system that only handled the cases of minors. The Juvenile Court Act gave the Chicago Juvenile Court broad jurisdiction over persons under the age of 16 who were considered delinquent, dependent, or neglected. In this act, it authorized the state to become the juvenile's parent when it evoked the parents' patriae. This basically means that since the juvenile offenders were not able to enter legally binding contracts, the state will serve as aid to the juvenile offender. In addition, the act required that the court be overseen by a special judge, that hearings be held in a separate courtroom, and that separate records be kept of juvenile hearings. By creating the juvenile court, the state was able to bypass the due process protections that were required by the Supreme Court for all adult cases. The idea of a juvenile court spread rapidly and most followed the Illinois model. It seemed to be working quite well for the time. Even when juvenile courts were challenged legally, the courts generally upheld the legality of the system and the principle of parents' patriae, therefore supporting the state's efforts. But even though the new juvenile system was going strong, there wasn't much oversight or regulation. Basically, the juvenile court and the child savers were having a free-for-all in pushing their agenda. This included requiring little transparency for the hearings, so charges could be brought against anyone who appeared to be criminal or who might have criminal tendencies. No one knew what happened during the court proceedings as they were closed to the public and there were no transcripts left to review. Remember they were taking kids in even if they didn't commit crimes, so it was not a stretch that they would punish them without admittance of guilt too. The other large issue was the lack of consistency from the judges and the court officials. Minors never knew what to expect when they were standing in front of the judge. As we move into the 1960s and 70s, there are even more calls for reform. But now they're trying to get the juvenile system away from what harms the original reformers caused. Even though it is a juvenile system and it is supposed to be separate from the adult system, the juveniles need to be afforded the same protections that adults are receiving. This meant due process protections. 
The Kent decision made it clear that due process rights needed to be extended to juveniles who were being transferred to criminal court for trial. This means that at the very least, a hearing needed to occur before the transfer could happen. The defendant must have counsel. That counsel must have access to social records being kept by the juvenile court. And finally, that there had to be strong and sufficient reason for the transfer. Within a year of the Kent decision, the United States Supreme Court heard the landmark case Henry Galt in 1967, which gave juveniles a number of due process protections for those who were staying within the juvenile system. These protections included the right against self-incrimination, the right to adequate notice of charges that were brought against them, the right to confront and cross-examine their accusers, the right to assistance of counsel, and the right to sworn testimony and further repeal. What's interesting about the juvenile justice system is that the juvenile offenders are never found guilty by the court. Instead, they are adjudicated delinquent by the judge and there is never a jury trial that takes place. After the Galt case, we see that the standard of proof is up for debate. Because juveniles are not found guilty like adults are, do we need to hold them to the same standard of evidentiary proof, meaning proof beyond a reasonable doubt? It is possible to hold them to a lower standard. The answer is maybe. Typically, you can use the preponderance of evidence standard, which means that there is about a 50-50 shot that the juvenile in question should be adjudicated delinquent. But additionally, the court came back in the case of Henry Winship and stated that if there is the possibility that the juvenile may face some sort of confinement, then you have to use the standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. What was important about this ruling was that it took one step further away from the idea that the government is responsible for saving the whole child from ruining their entire future. Now we're moving towards the idea that it is not up to the court to take a preventative role, but instead the court should intervene only when the child does something which constitutes delinquency. There are other organizations out there that can focus on the social aspects of trying to help out children but the juvenile court is not that place anymore. So it is reactive and relies on offense-based sentencing rather than being proactive with the punitive orientations of the past. Later in 1971 in McKeever v. Pennsylvania, the court held that juveniles were not entitled to a trial by jury, a decision aimed at maintaining the mission of the juvenile court as treatment. Instead, the judge would remain the sole decision maker in these cases. Adult trials use a jury of the defendant's peers to evaluate the defendant's guilt. In this instance, ju the juvenile's peers are also juveniles and are legally unable to make those decisions. Juvenile court procedures were still characterized by an informality that most people would find unacceptable if it was applied to adults in criminal court. When a juvenile offender goes to court, there are three outcomes that can occur. First, the charges are outright dismissed, just like an adult court, but this happens very rarely. It is not very helpful to think that this will happen. Next, we know that the juvenile can either be adjudicated delinquent and sent to a community-based program, or they can be sent to an institutional facility. Institutional facilities are really detention facilities that only house juvenile offenders. They are separate from adults, they receive treatment and are required to continue with their education while they are in the facility. Like adults, juveniles are able to be sentenced to a variety of community-based programs including probation, parole, attending a foster home, or even a diversionary program. Community-based programs are meant to accomplish a variety of objectives. They are meant to control offenders, provide sanctions for offenders' behavior while allowing youth to maintain existing ties to the community, they aim to help youth restore ties and develop new and positive ones with the community, something that we call integrate, reintegration. They avoid the negative consequences of institutional placement and provide a more cost-effective response to offenders while still reducing the likelihood of recidivism for these juvenile offenders. Juvenile probation is by far the most popular sentence that these minors can be sentenced to. It is almost a compromise sentence for those juveniles who have not really committed a very serious offense and are not yet considered chronic offenders. It allows the juvenile to be supervised in the community and avoids the harshness that institutionalization provides.
there are juvenile probation officers who supervise these young offenders. There are still probation conditions present, but they are adapted to the needs of the juvenile. Instead of maintaining a job, juveniles are required to attend school and not skip school, for instance. But everything that must occur for adult probation has to occur with juvenile probation too. Probation officers are still required to conduct a PSI in order to determine the proper sentence. They must provide treatment services and other, other forms of treatment to help the juvenile. They must supervise them and they must make sure that they're not violating the terms of their conditions. If they are violating their conditions, then the probation officer can revocate the probationer. A trend in juvenile probation is the development of intensive supervision probation programs, which in some jurisdictions involve home confinement. The use of home confinement employing electronic monitoring of ju juvenile offenders has some attractive advantages. For instance, it eases the problem of detention overcrowding. It also allows youth to participate in counseling, education, or vocational programs without endangering public safety. It allows youth to live with supervision in a more natural environment than in an institution. It also allows court workers to better assess the ability of youth to live in the community under standard probation after they leave the program. Additionally, juveniles are often required to pay some sort of restitution in addition to their probation sentence. This may be in the form of monetary restitution, but more frequently we're seeing the juveniles being required to either do something for the victim or work so many community service hours as part of their sentence. Institutional programs are the most restrictive placements available to juvenile courts and they vary in the extent to which they focus on custody and control. If, if a juvenile offender is sent to an institutional facility, there are a few options in which they can be sent. Detention facilities are synonymous with adult prisons, but they are solely for juveniles and they are mostly set up in dormitory style. However, they do still have barbed wire fences and security for containment purposes. These places are often pretty small in comparison to some adult facilities. Depending on their location, they can house upwards of 800 residents, but that's an extreme and often rare example. If there is no room at the detention facilities or if the juvenile was transferred to the adult court, juvenile offenders can be sent to adult jails and prisons. However, they must be separated from the adult offenders through sight and sound separation. Reception and diagnostic centers are often used if the juvenile is exhibiting signs of mental illness, suicidal tendencies, or are exhibiting signs that they may be harmful to others. These are traditionally short-term stay facilities and are meant to be a stopgap before the juvenile is sent to their more permanent facility. Ranches, forestry camps, farms, and some training schools are, for the most part, all open facilities that allow for more movement. They typically there are typically private facilities and are located in more remote areas than the detention facilities are. They don't have perimeter fencing and are for lower risk offenders who are not likely to run. We spoke earlier about the corruption and the harm that would frequently occur in the early days of the juvenile justice system. For the most part, that behavior has been eradicated, but there are still pockets of it that pop up from time to time. In 2009, one of these scandals surfaced when it was revealed that a Pennsylvania judge named Mark Ciavelia was actually selling juvenile offenders to a private detention facility. Well, what do I mean by this? In 2008, investigations began when it was revealed that this judge was allegedly accepting kickbacks from the builder of a private, for-profit youth center for every juvenile offender that he sentenced there. And he was sending a lot of them there for very small offenses that did not really warrant a detention sentence, such as stealing DVDs from Walmart and trespassing in vacant buildings. This former judge was found guilty and was sentenced to 28 years in a federal prison. He was found guilty of taking more than $2.6 million in kickbacks for sending more than 5,000 kids to these facilities. That breaks down to roughly $520 per kid. This scandal has been since named the Kids for Cash scandal and has been fictionalized in several popular TV dramas. Despite the long history of juvenile correctional institutions, there is surprisingly little information on the effectiveness of this response to juvenile offenders.
Although there is some indication that effective institutional programs for juveniles exist, the bulk of the evidence indicates that many juvenile institutions have little effect on recidivism. A recent review of rearrest rates that tracked use for three or more years after release from juvenile institutions reported that 74 to 89 percent were rearrested for a new crime. This chart shows the recent trends in juvenile incarceration. As you can see, juveniles are being arrested less frequently for violent crimes. There was a peak in the early 1990s when people were afraid that a more violent super juvenile was starting to become the norm. But that did not hold true and the arrest rates have, have declined substantially. In reaction to the lowered arrest rates, we are also seeing a decreased use in detention facilities in both the private and public sectors. We are still seeing the continued use of adult jails and state prisons, however. Finally, in this last slide, we can see a breakdown of public and private juvenile detention facilities and who is incarcerated in these facilities. Notice the racial and ethnic breakdown located there comparative to the distribution of these groups located in the U.S. There is a disproportionately large percentage of males and racial or ethnic minorities that are incarcerated, just like in adult prisons and jails. However, what's interesting is that Hispanic juveniles are overrepresented in public facilities, yet underrepresented in private ones. And following most incarceration trends, white juveniles are vastly underrepresented in both the public and private arenas. In this lecture, we focused on the origins of the juvenile justice system and saw the pressing need for reform in all areas. When reform did occur, it still wasn't about helping the juvenile offenders in the ways that it should be. Sending juveniles to reformatories and boarding houses often ended up in abuse and sometimes even death for those juveniles who lived there. The 1960s and 70s marked a period of major reform for the juvenile justice system and moved away from the erroneous ways of the past. Now the juvenile justice system is more structured and a lot less harmful to the juveniles they are trying to treat, even though we know that some abuses still occur. It is impossible to eliminate them completely. In our next lecture, and consequently our last lecture for the semester, we're going to explore what's next. What does the future of criminal justice look like, and where are we going from here? I'll see you next time for Chapter 14. Have a great day, everyone.